All right, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Peter, who's developing on uh, LibUSB. And uh, this is a talk I was interested in because I am an embedded systems developer, and for many years I would get these little Linux boards that just have a TX, RX, ground, plain old serial, and I wire it to my laptop, and everything works fine. And now my last fucking three laptops don't have a goddamn serial port, and I have to get a goddamn FTDI chip and hope that the, the uh, driver works for it, but there must be some great reason for why we have this now, and uh, maybe Peter can explain to us what it is. <laughs> So this widescreen stuff, it's, it's way too modern for apparently my driver stack. I wish it would help. Can I get some hints? Does anyone know XRender outside and in, and especially with this widescreen thing? Minus R? What? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is listed, right? It is there. So, how do we get it? Sorry? Out. Out. Okay. Here we go. Thank you, sir. I don't know, is, is that my fault? Is there something you can do magically about that? Sorry? Okay, it's been like that before. Sorry? Does that ruin anything for you? The video angles? No? Okay, good. So let's do this. I'm sorry I'm late. Uh, so let's get started. I'm going to blast you with some USB stuff. Um, I hope you'll enjoy it. I'm going to do a brief introduction. I'm going to talk about why I'm doing this talk. Then I'll talk about Universal Serial Bus, USB. Some uh, overview of the bus, background for the bus, terminology. Um, a little bit about electrical. specifications for the bus or properties of the bus, limitations of USB, uh, communication, how, uh, how we talk to each other on USB or using USB. I'm going to talk about descriptors. That's a really important concept in USB. Standard device classes, also uh, pretty neat. Developing host software. We, we have these nice devices, but we also want software to talk to the devices, right? So um, I'm going to touch on different uh, approaches to writing this software. Kernel drivers and user space drivers or applications driving the device. And I'll talk about LibUSB, a project that um, I've been involved with for a while and I like a lot. Some history of the project, kernel relationship for uh, LibUSB as a user space library and show you some code snippets. So my name is Peter Stuge. 
I've been doing consulting in Sweden for a long time, software hardware security. I'm about to move here to Berlin. That's going to be a lot of fun to do uh, some interesting cell phone research. Um, I've been doing electronics and uh, computing stuff since the 80s and open source really passionately since about the 90s. Maybe you've heard me talk about Core Boot some other time. I started looking at LibUSB in 2003 because I was doing a, a training session for uh, engineers, marketing, um, executives, and uh, one more group of people in the same seminar, and that didn't really work out so well. But anyway, I got into USB because I thought this is a really neat technology. So, um, And since this fall, I'm now the active maintainer of LibUSB. I'm also a member of the Swedish open source network Foskgruppen. So we're going to learn about USB. And this is, uh, this is nice because we want to use it in our own devices that we create and make. And sometimes we also want to write some software that can drive someone else's devices. How many has, have actually used LibUSB already? All right, that's nice. That's I guess about 30, 30, 50 hands, something. Cool. So Universal Serial Robust, this is a, a standard managed by a company called the USB Implementers Forum Incorporated. They do this over at usb.org. And as far as standards development go uh, goes, I think this is a, a pretty, they make the, the outcome of their work really accessible. It's easy to just download the PDF. There's no click through, there's no agreements. The PDF is, is just there on the website. It's really, really good. The standard covers a, a whole bunch of stuff. It's uh, pretty detailed. It goes into uh, specifics for cabling, uh, for USB devices, connectors on devices and on hosts, and what, what connectors go where and so on. It talks about power consumption. It talks about the signaling that goes inside the cable and the communications protocol that goes on top of the signaling, and much more. The design goals for USB was to, um, as was mentioned in the introduction, be able to connect peripherals to PCs, because legacy ports are, were, at the time, about to go away, and um, there were good reasons for that. They were too big, they were uh, sometimes kind of expensive, and. Um, there were too many different ports as well. So USB came in to take over the task of those random connectors on the backside of a PC. Plug and play was an important consideration when developing this uh, standard. Mechanical connector keying is, is um, what helps with that. So it's really, it's not possible to insert a cable the wrong way, for example. If the cable fits, then you've plugged it in correctly. That's a, a simple way to make sure that things work easily. Of course, you can turn the, the connector um, upside down, right? And try to insert it and it won't fit. And that's kind of annoying, but hey, they, they got a lot of things right, I think. A strong focus for, for USB, for the USB specification, was to um, allow devices to be very simple and also cheap to manufacture. And as a result of this, USB places a lot of responsibility on the host. And we'll, um, we'll talk a bit more, I'll talk a bit more about what the host is and what devices are uh, in a bit. But it's, um, there's a lot of work to do as a host. And if you're a, a device, life is much, much easier. Communication is, is driven completely by the host. It's pulled. So the host actually talks to each device in turn and and um, asks it, do you want to do anything? And USB has become really, really popular. Eight billion host ports, and apparently it's increasing with lots of billions every year. A couple of connectors. The standard, standard ones are uh, the type A and the type B. On the top, I've heard that the big type B on the top is, is being phased out, and um, that mini and micro should be used for, for new stuff. So the A connectors, they are supposed to be toward the host, and the B connectors are supposed to be toward the device. That's the rule. And um, yeah, I guess we've all seen the mini, mini 
connectors and uh, on cell phones, I think in EU, you really need to have a micro USB connector if you're supposed to sell it. So important stuff, I've, I've already mentioned host, that this is a, a big concept or an uh, important part of, of USB. A couple of examples of hosts, the, the by far most common USB host is um, the one in your laptop or, or um, desktop computer or server for that matter. It's a PC chipset, has a, um, a host built in. But there are also USB hosts in system on chips. So the, the um, either if you're designing your own system on chip, I know that there's a um, um, workshop and, uh, and more about the Milky Mist that Sebastian has made, which has a USB host also. And it's also available in things like the OMAP system on chips, um, the, the processors, and uh, larger, larger uh, microcontrollers as well. Device, that's everything you connect to a host. So um, mice, um, foam and missile gun, printers, um, camera, memory card reader, etc., etc. Devices can be bus powered or self powered, so they can actually devices can actually get all the power they need from the bus, which is a pretty nice feature of USB. But it's not really the the only important feature of USB, in my opinion. Devices are self describing. This is this is pretty important to uh, to get get right. This is what device manufacturers uh, struggle can struggle a lot with. Because if these uh, descriptors, as they're called, that this describe the device are not quite correct, then the operating systems are going to um, be upset and the applications are going to be upset. They won't be able to communicate with this device. And nothing works until you get everything right. So if you're doing your own development, uh, your own device development, like we'll do in the workshop later, then um, it, can be, it can be a bit annoying because um, Nothing works until you get everything right, but it's it's not that difficult if you if you're a little bit careful and you have the USB spec beside you when you're doing the the work. So descriptors, there are a couple of different types of descriptors that make up the specification for the device. There's um, configurations, there are interfaces and endpoints, and these have these have descriptors. Each of them, I'll get back to that in a bit. And there are hubs. They are important. They help create more ports because the host might only have a single port. Um, however, you, you really want to connect more than one thing. So you use a hub as a splitter to, um, yeah, to get more ports. Some look at uh, different versions of USB. Started out back in 96, 98, sometime with a USB 1 and low speed. One and a half megabit, full speed, 12 megabit. Around this time, there was also a specification for the host controller interface. So the host controller is the actual chip, the, the PCI chip or um, whatever bus it is on, that implements a host. And there were two standards, which was a little bit silly, but I guess um, the companies involved, they competed and they all, they, they each wanted their own. So there were two host controller interfaces. And this is a programming guide. It's a register specification for how you program a host chip. There were two. So you need two drivers in the kernel or, uh, well, you only need the one that fits your hardware. But it's, um, it's a, a little bit annoying that there are two to keep track of. So with USB 2.0, there was um, also the addition of high-speed communication, so 480 megabits per second. I guess this was because FireWire was doing 400 megabits per second, and uh, well, anything new had to be a little bit faster. So, so 480 is what we got. And also around the time of USB 2.0, there was the EHCI host controller um, specification. So USB 2.0 host chips, they are all programmed exactly the same way. So we only need a single driver for that. That's nice, as long as they adhere to EHCI, that is. But, but most do, so that's good. 
And worth noting here is that while USB 2.0 adds high speed, uh, a device can still be 2.0 compliant and compatible if it only does low speed or full speed. So saying that a device is USB 2 compatible, um, if a vendor does it or if, if I do it, then it doesn't really mean that the device is high speed or high speed capable. 2.0, um, after the base 2.0 spec, there was this on-the-go addition or supplement, which allows two devices to connect to each other. Take, for example, um, a digital camera and a printer. So it's, if you have these two, it's kind of neat to be able to print directly from the camera, right? And this is what on-the-go would allow. Um, it says host-free connections, but in practice, one of the devices will sort of switch personality and become a host for, for this particular connection. But it's, it's restricted, it's not a full host in any way. Anyway, it's, um, I don't know really how widespread it is, I haven't used it a lot. How, has, how, how many have used on the go ever? One, two, three, okay, yeah, four, cool. Did it work well? So-so, <laughs> okay. No, not really. Okay. 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 Yeah. I not. It's a neat idea, but not maybe not that uh, widespread. And uh, a few years ago, there was USB 3.0, new specification and a new speed, of course, called super speed, and it's five gigabits per second. And along with that came also a new host controller interface. So that, but it, it's still just one. That's good. I, there are some, some early devices out and some actually some, some PCs which have USB 3, but I haven't used it much. And as far as the programming goes, it, it doesn't really change all that much either. Uh, for one particular, in one particular um, transfer type, super, um, USB 3 adds a new, um, new field or a new um, channel identifier that you can use to further divide your communication into two streams or whatever. But overall, the communication um, is quite similar to, to what it was like before in USB 2 and also in USB 1. Electrically, the, cable, uh, the, the connections are point to point, so there's no on the cable level sort of splicing or uh, cables just have to run from one port to another port, and it should be one A port and one B port. There are four wires in the cables, it's five volts and um, uh, ground, and then there's differential signaling, so a data plus and a data minus. How many people know what differential signaling is, and how it works? Cool, excellent, so that's about 60%, I think. Quickly, for, for the others, uh, differential signaling means that you have two signals that do the opposite. Instead of having one static signal and another which is the value, you measure the value by seeing the difference in these two signals. And the bonus is that if there's some kind of interference on this, um, on this cable, then the interference is going to be the same on both wires and then you can effectively cancel it out. So, and it's the same principle also used in just plain Ethernet networking. There are some limitations to USB. You can only have 127 devices per bus, including hubs. So um, you can't go completely crazy, but 127 devices is, is still a lot. You can go maximum seven levels deep. So the host is one level, your end device is one level, and the hubs in between also take one level. And you can have, um, so you can have a maximum of five hubs or active extension cables which are also hubs um, about cables cables can be a maximum of five meters this means that the maximum distance if you're you're doing the you're using five five uh, five meter cables then the maximum distance you get is under 30 meters so USB is not really meant for deployment of like a, a building wide peripheral network, um, but rather something, some things that are pretty close to the, the PC or the host. 
And the current that can be drawn by devices is also limited by the specification. The absolute maximum is 500 milliamps in the base 2.0 spec. There's also been uh, some additional specifications to allow specifically for charging batteries in, in handheld devices that allow the, the current draw to go up even higher. If the, uh, the, um, if the hub that the device is connected to is bus powered, then all you can get is 100 milliamps. So then you can do a lot, lot less. And maybe there's some, maybe this device that you have needs a lot of power. Uh, it really needs more than um, 100 milliamps of, of current. Then it simply cannot work in that specific configuration if it is connected to a bus powered hub. And the neat thing is that all this information about how much power that a device needs is also encoded in the descriptors. So the operating system can discover that, hey, you plugged in this device into uh, a USB port, which can't really make it run at full capacity. So maybe you want to change that somehow. And there's also a limit on how much current devices can draw in suspend. And that's only half a milliampere, so not a lot. Communication, USB is a serial bus, as the name says. That means that only one thing happens at a time, even though there are these hundred, uh, hundred odd devices. It's broken down into time slots. There's um, a concept of frames. That's minimum, minimum um, of the atom communication atom on the wire. It's one millisecond for low speed and uh, for full speed, and for high speed communication, it's um, one eighth of a millisecond, so 125 microseconds, called a microframe there. Transfers is the um, logical unit or concept that um, is used for doing communication, for programming communication. So I, I say that I want to do one transfer, and this transfer is um, made up of a couple of different packet types which fit into frames. So I'm, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this. This is, is mostly relevant for maybe doing implementing a USB logic block or implementing a, a piece of um, piece of software that would bit bang a USB communication protocol. But um, it's more fun to focus on on actually ready-made hardware that, that is already known to work and um, just use USB for the data exchange. So that's that's what I'll do. Um, I'm going to mention though the packet types um, or the, the stages in a transfer. There's the, the first stage, which is a setup that contains information about what will this, um, this particular transfer be. Then there may be data or there may be no data. And finally, there's a handshake at the end. The handshake says yes. Um, well, the handshake is one of ACK, NAC, install. And ACK means, OK, data transferred, fine. NAC basically uh, is used to say, no, I don't have any data yet. So the, um, the device responds back with a NAC. And that doesn't mean the communication failed. It means, um, sorry, no data for you right now. Come back later, please. And stall is, on the other hand, some kind of error that will need action to be corrected. I've been talking about transfers. There are four transfer types specified in USB. And uh, understanding these and, and um, applying them to the, the problem at hand is maybe the bigger, bigger challenge in de uh, developing a USB device, because they have complementary, but still uh, sometimes conflicting properties. And um, it, it can be tricky, but with a few simple guidelines, it's easy to get it right. Control transfers is the, um, the most basic, basic type, maybe easiest also. It's command response or request reply. I'm, uh, I have some numbers here on how much bus bandwidth they are allowed to occupy. I have a lot of slides, so I'm, I'm going to skip over that, but you have the numbers here. Uh, control transfers are tried to, um, are, are de delivered on best effort basis, so it might take a while before they, before they actually go out, but they will never be lost. 
there's a limit on, on the data uh, you can send as well. Interrupt transfers is periodical data exchange and it can take up to 90% of the frame on the bus. So there's still 10% left, maybe for control, maybe for something else, depending on what software is actually wanting to communicate on the bus right now. Interrupt transfers are just one way. So control was request response, but interrupt transfers is always, um, an interrupt transfer is always just one way. Then there's bulk, which is um, just take as much bandwidth as you can, but there's no guarantee that it will arrive in any specific time. So it might take a while. Whereas with interrupt, it's, it's periodical. If you set also in the descriptor that this is going to be transferred once per millisecond, then that's, that is really the rule. It's going, to, it's going to happen. It's going to be allowed to, uh, to do transfers and um, expected to do transfers every millisecond. Whereas bulk just takes as much as is free. When no one else is doing any, any kind of transfer, then bulk gets, gets the rest. Bulk transfer is not allowed in uh, low speed devices, but is, is fine both in full speed and, and high speed. Finally, there's isochronous transfers, which you might recognize from Firewire also. This is guaranteed latency, so that's similar to the interrupt transfers where the, the, the periodicity is, is really fixed. It will happen, there will be a transfer at this, um, this given interval. And also the, the data rate is constant, so isochronous really reserves bandwidth on the bus for the, the particular data transfer. This is typically used for streaming. However, there's, there are no retries. So if there's a, a signaling error on the bus, then all the other types, they're going to be retried and eventually they will succeed, hopefully. But isochronous will just, it's like UDP, it's fire and forget, and if it arrives, then fine. But if it doesn't, then we're going to move on to the next, next stuff. So it's a good fit for, for real-time streaming. Endpoints, big, uh, big, important, big important thing. This is what originates or uh, receives all, all transfers, all data transfer to and from devices go over endpoints. Each endpoint has a number and a direction, 0 to 15, and in or out, not, not really complicated. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that if you're going to do bidirectional communication, then you're going to need two endpoints. So, for example, with the interrupt transfers, as I said, they're, they're only one, one direction. If you need interrupt transfers both going in and coming out, then you need two interrupt endpoints. They can have the same number, as long as one is in and the other is out. And the numbers are really up to the device developer to choose the, the addresses. So, except for endpoint zero, which is the default endpoint, it's... Um, regulated in USB spec that this must always be a control endpoint and it has a, a couple of um, particular requests or, or transfers that it needs to support. Read descriptor is one of them. But every other endpoint is really up to the device developer to decide, almost. So I'll come back to device classes which can limit the developer somehow. So the question is, I mentioned 127 devices, and now I'm saying 0 to 15 addresses. Um, there can be 127 devices, and each device can have a number of endpoints. And now we're looking at the endpoints and, and seeing that each endpoint within a device can have a number between, or will have a number between 0 and, and 15 and also the direction in, in or out. So a total, a maximum total would be 16 times 2 in and out times 127 devices. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. 
So uh, we have a, now we have a, a bunch of endpoints that are using a specific transfer type that fits our application and uh, we, we group them together and we um, specify some, some kind of behavior for them and that is then called an interface. And for that interface we make an interface descriptor also and, and um, put some, some information there. Descriptors. There's an overall device descriptor, there's just one in each device. It has um, various information about the device, like the manufacturer ID and uh, the supported spec number and, and so on. It's on the bottom. Um, inside is configuration descriptors. So one configuration or multiple configurations. Inside each configuration are interface descriptors. Zero or more. And inside each endpoint descriptor, uh, sorry, inside each interface descriptor is zero or more endpoint descriptor, descriptors. So there can be multiple interfaces in each configuration. A configuration is a high level, high level mode for a device. I, I imagine it like one of these um, um, mode knobs that you can, can use for, for some, um, some devices, where the device completely changes its behavior switching it back and forth. An example would be a guitar amplifier that I heard about, uh, which can be either a storage device because it has an SD card reader, or it could be a human interface device because it has a display and a couple of buttons. Unfortunately, they were implemented as configurations rather than interfaces. So you have to switch between one, um, or you have to switch between the two. You can't have them both at the same time. Whereas if they had been implemented as interfaces in one configuration, then they could be running simultaneously. Interfaces are concurrent and independent. So again, multiple interfaces can be running and doing different things and, and completely offering completely different functionality within one configuration. I haven't seen a lot of devices with multiple configurations. Some advanced smartphones use it uh, for example, to switch the device into firmware upgrade mode. Other than that, not so much. So, uh, question is, are configurations and interfaces used, for example, with um, mobile broadband devices, which include the drivers, the driver software on the device itself, and it shows up as either a modem or maybe both a modem and a, a, a device. And I, I'd say it depends on the manufacturer. The devices I have personal experience from is um, uh, Huawei modems, 3G modems, and they do either or. They can only run in, in one mode. So. They, and they even complicate it further. They, they're not using um, either configurations or interfaces. They're using um, their own vendor specific thing to switch personality of the device completely. So even though they could use these two configurations, they decided to make their device appear as only one thing at a time ever. When you first connect it, it's a CD. And uh, if you send it some magic thing, then it's going to disappear. It's going to disconnect from USB and then switch something internally. And when it comes back, it's all of a sudden a modem. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thanks. What Sorry? I know the reason is because uh, usually they're using cheap, descriptor, uh, cheap um, USB controllers that have only eight endpoints. And so they can't use multiple configuration. Could be could be limitations in in the chipsets, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry. Okay. Apparently, some Huawei are both um, both. Yeah, yeah. Maybe maybe it's a newer newer model. The one I have is is kind of old. While interfaces can be running at the same time and doing different things, configurations cannot. You can only select one of them. 
And also the configuration indicates how much power this, this device is going to need or um, how much current it, it will want to draw in this particular configuration. And looking at the device descriptor, we'll, we'll um, uh, get into the configuration descriptors and interface descriptors and endpoint descriptors in detail in the workshop. But looking at the device descriptor, it has, as I mentioned, the device version and the device class, which I'll come back to, and a, a vendor ID and a product ID to uniquely identify this device in, um, among all other USB devices in the system. There might also be some, um, some text stored inside the device as string descriptors, which are referenced from the device descriptor with the, the name of the manufacturer and um, also configurations and interfaces can have names too. It's not used much. So this is a, a small diagram of the descriptors and how they relate to each other. One device descriptor, one or, or more configuration descriptors, and inside a configuration, one or more interfaces and endpoints within the interfaces. So device classes. There are some, some kind of devices that are really common. Keyboards, um, mass storage, memory sticks, modems, network connection devices, audio devices. These, these, these are examples of devices that when I plug it in, I expect it to, to work the same as the competitor's product, which really does the same thing, but maybe it has a green LED on top instead of a blue one. So this was also standardized by the USB um, uh, implementers forum. There are a whole bunch of device class specifications. These are just some of them. So maybe um, human interface device is the most common one for keyboards and, and mice and joysticks and so on, buttons and displays. Mass storage class for hard drives, uh, portable hard drives and, and flash memory sticks and so on. Communications device class has a serial port, ethernet and, and more. Audio. And then there's a device firmware upgrade, the DFU class, which is um, a little bit uh, odd because, or a little bit different from the others because it interacts with X other, um, other um, interfaces or other configurations. The DFU process, the, the firmware upgrade process is a bit complicated, so it's, it requires more from the host software. The benefit with having these device classes, they, they specify similar interfaces or identical interfaces, so that a USB mouse will always look the same, or um, will at least be describing itself in a way that one single driver can understand. So I only need one driver to support all USB mice, which is neat and nice and great. Same thing for storage, of course, and audio and so on. Then there's the, the odd or the, the exception Vendor-specific interfaces, and I really like these. Now, vendor-specific, that it's, it's, a lot of times it's really a bad thing. It's difficult to deal with and a hassle and not really something um, you associate happy thoughts with. But for USB, I think it's, it's actually awesome because there are no endpoint restrictions on the device beyond endpoint zero, of course. Um, the, all these device classes, they specify exactly what, which endpoints should be there and which, how should they, what should they do, what should they um, communicate, what are their limitations. Whereas a vendor-specific interface, you're, you're completely free to make whatever in, um, combination of endpoints you want that happens to fit your application. So, yeah, you make the optimal combination of endpoints and maybe... Uh, Maybe your device isn't really a, a hid, so then um, it's good to use vendor specific instead. Another big benefit is that kernel drivers will not attach to a device with a vendor specific interface because the kernel drivers are written to support one specific device class or maybe a couple of specific device classes. And for vendor specific, there's no way to know what the device expects and how the driver should, should drive it. It's vendor specific. so. There's no kernel driver to, um, to have to consider if you're going to write some software to program this device on your own. 
This is important because unbinding a kernel driver from a device once it's it's um, sort of lodged on can be really really painful. Uh, it depends a lot on the operating system. In Linux, it's fairly easy. You just have to have the right permissions, and then the the uh, driver is is removed from this um, interface. But for Mac OS, you need um, you need super user privileges, and you need a reboot. That's not so nice. And then for for Windows, you need to um, actually replace the driver that is attached to the device. So and which also requires super user privilege, and which requires creating a restore point, which takes anywhere from a couple to twenty seconds. So vendor specific is good. It's often accessible without a specific kernel driver. On, this is true on, on the operating systems supported by LibUSB, except for Windows, which is always odd. And um, that's okay, though, because on Windows, Microsoft has released WinUSB, and there's also this LibUSB 0.sys, which I'll come back to in a bit. Okay, so we've looked a bit at devices and uh, how they communicate, and what about the situation of developing the host software, so the, the software yeah, driving this device. We have a choice typically between implementing a, a driver in kernel or outside the kernel in, in user space. Now, a kernel device driver has many advantages, of course. It, it runs a bit faster, maybe avoids some, some scheduling, and um, it can use everything that the kernel offers, which can be a, a significant benefit for devices that should be tied into the kernel somehow. So I've, I've written devices with existing infrastructure, that's keyboard, storage, the speakers, all these already have interfaces in the kernel that we want to use. I mean, if I plug in a, a keyboard, a USB keyboard, and I start typing, I expect the characters to show up on my console, right? So there is some, some kind of console layer in the kernel that I want this USB device to feed into. Same with storage, I want to be able to mount my, my uh, memory stick or the speakers. I want to be able to use my, my ordinary mixer software to control the volume of these, these speakers. The alternative is a user space application. Could be stuff like cell phone firmware upgrader using the DFU or really any application-specific devices. There's a lot of, of application-specific devices out there. One that came up on the LibUSB list a while ago was a, a color, um, what's it called, a color a, a tuner that is used to measure, color calibration is, is the word, is, is used to measure the, the correct correctness of color uh, representation or, or um, color on a flat screen. So there's not really, not really a kernel API for that. There's no kernel infrastructure for that. So it makes a lot of sense to have such a device be vendor specific. And LibUSB. LibUSB is a really straightforward API for doing USB transfers across a whole bunch of operating systems. Linux, Mac OS, we support Windows. Some versions of the API work on Solaris, and FreeBSD uh, also has a LibUSB compatible API. Supports synchronous and asynchronous programming. Either you, you just fire and wait until the transfer is done, or you can queue up a lot of um, transfers and um, write your program in, in more of an asynchronous manner. And uh, since version 1.0, LibUSB is also thread safe. Some history. This is this is um, uh, this is a massive slide, but it's um, it's important because there's uh, it's it's really easy to get confused by the couple of different LibUSB versions out there. The original LibUSB was uh, version 0 0.1, started by Johannes Eldfeld long long ago, and it was just a helper API on top of the Linux. API, the Linux user space API that the kernel already offered. LibUSB 0.1 was just a proof of concept really to test if, if this was a, a useful library. 
And apparently it was good enough because it got used quite widely. Um, maybe you've used a scanner in Linux or um, copied photos of your digital camera. <clears throat> Sorry. Or printed to a USB printer. And chances are that you, you might have, if, if you did this a while ago, you would probably be using LibUSB code. And this was, this was only for Linux, and it got support for Mac OS also after a while. But Windows people, they, they also wanted this API because it's, it's really pretty easy to use. However, that was implemented separately in the LibUSB Win32 project by Stefan Meyer. And it is the, the 0 0.1 API, it's just an implementation for Windows. And it, it, but it also extends the 0 0.1 API and adds support for, for missing stuff. In, in original LibUSB. And to make this work on Windows, they also needed to come up with a kernel driver, which is this LibUSB 0.sys, which is, is really nice. And finally, since a couple of years, there's LibUSB 1.0. It was um, designed by a committee. We spent a lot of time on the mailing list going back and forth, and uh, Sun created their open uh, USB, which is basically their their vision of LibUSB 1.0. Um, but no one really stepped up to implement it until Daniel Drake came along and um, did an a implementation and uh, is, he's also still the, the lead maintainer of, of LibUSB. The API was, was really um, thought through. We, while 0 0.1 was kind of proof of concept and, and try, is this a good idea? We tried to, to cover, cover the basis with 1.0, and it's, it's, it seems to have worked out pretty good. There are still some things that have come up that we're missing, but that's for 1.1. 1.0 is much more complete. There's um, support for threaded, multi-threaded apps. There's uh, isochronous, there's a synchronous API, etc., etc. And there's also the experimental Windows uh, support since a while back. Using currently WinUSB, which I mentioned Microsoft has, um, has provided, it's, um, WinUSB offers sort of the same functionality as the LibUSB Zero driver in theory, but in practice there are some differences. We also want, but so far WinUSB is, is what we can uh, make use of in LibUSB on Windows. LibUSB 0.sys is, we really want to support that because it allows an easy migration from LibUSB Win32 into using LibUSB 1.0 on Windows, and it's a ticket for it. There hasn't been a release of LibUSB 1.0 in a while, and um, I'm working uh, to, to make sure that we get that release out really, really soon now. Um, and the goal is to have it out before the end of the year. I think that's going to work out. Yeah, you laugh, but no, it's, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that'll be fine. Uh, so the LibUSB kernel relationship, there's always a kernel driver, right? We're, I'm, I'm standing here and talking about how to use LibUSB to program devices from user space, but we can't do that directly ever. We always have to use a kernel driver somehow, and we in LibUSB rely on a kernel driver which provides some kind of API that we can make use of and go through to reach the devices. Linux has USB FS, it was called USB Dev FS before. On Windows, there's this uh, WinUSB and, and LibUSB drivers that I mentioned, where WinUSB, it's from Microsoft, it's included in Vista and later, but it's also possible to um, install after the fact on older uh, systems, so XP, and they, they made some, uh, some DLL package that you can redistribute also very easily to add WinUSB to a system. Also check out libwdi, which is um, also mentioned on the libusb.org page if you want to do this, uh, this driver, uh, driver control, uh, driver installation stuff on Windows. Really nice library for that. And libusb0 this is the kernel driver from the libusb Win32 project, which is still very much relevant because um, a question? question? Yes. So is uh, WinUSB an effective way to work around the vendor and device identifier registration process, sort of? 
um, <clears throat> where is it? On if Windows, you, a, you mean? If you have a device that has a, um, like a new identifier or identifier that um, isn't registered for um, the well-known classes, like a... Um, Keyboard. So that would work without having to add the, uh, the, device, uh, the vendor and device ID to the system? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool, thank you. Well, I, I, a, keyboard, a keyboard is picked up by the head driver, so if it's, if it's not something that the system will identify, then, so for, is, is this question specific for Windows? Yeah, okay, so this, the question is, if I understand you correctly, can LibUSB sort of skip the requirement to um, have this um, uh, tie of vendor ID, product ID to some kind of specific device class in Windows? And the answer is no, we cannot. Uh, Windows needs to have a driver for every device um, that it has attached. It needs to have a device class for every driver. But there are some tools to automate it, and libwdi is, is um, able to do it automatically. There are also some, some helper tools to, um, to create the inf files and, um, and necessary stuff to do that installation. The uh, follow-up question um, is, or the original question I asked, because for the registration you need administrative privileges to add the information to the system. Yes. Whereas if it was possible, you could just plug in a device without having administrative rights and get it to work. So, yeah. If it's, an, if it's an unknown device to the Windows system and you want to program it, then there needs to be a driver installed and you need admin privileges and there will be a, a restore point created. However, you can automate it, all of it using libwdi so that the user just gets this um, 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 administrative uh, um, security confirmation dialog, clicks yes, and then everything happens automatically. But, but yes, it, it will need the user's um, consent or, or um, acknowledgement or approval to, to actually do the installation. There's, there's no way around that in Windows. With USB, uh, sorry, with WinUSB or with LibUSB uh, zero driver. So, <coughs> the LibUSB zero.sys driver is uh, nicer because it allows full access to the device, whereas the WinUSB driver, it only really supports interrupt and, uh, and bulk transfers and control. It doesn't support isochronous. Too bad. The LibUSB 0.sys driver has been also signed, uh, sponsored by the community. Some code, LibUSB, this is how you find a particular device using libusb 1.0, the, the 1.0 API. It's not too bad, you need a, a device handle and you call, for example, open device with a vidpid and you give it the magic, the magic vendor ID, product ID and um, maybe you get an error or maybe it works. This is the code for a control transfer. Also not too bad. Forgive my tears variable names. Device handle is, is the one we got from discovery. Vendrick is um, saying that this transfer is a vendor specific request that is going to be addressed at the device instead of at the interface or at a specific endpoint. Uh, the rec parameter, the request parameter is a, just an arbitrary number that I send to the firmware. Val is also arbitrary value I send to the firmware. Zero is index, another arbitrary value. Uh, data points to, or the, the data buffer is some data bytes that I want to send, and len is the number of that, and thousand is a timeout. Pretty straightforward. Here's some code for interrupt transfers. It's a little bit longer. We do an interrupt transfer. In this case, I want to ignore timeouts because I want it to spin over and over and um, read data as, as long as possible and some error checking, and um, finally, down the bottom, there's some um, processing of the input. I want to say thanks to the Chaos Angles, as always, because this is a great conference. And I want to say thanks to all the LibUSB contributors over the years, 
So some of the names are Johannes Edfeldt and Daniel Drake. But there's also a lot of work done by Xiaofan Chen and Tim Roberts, Nathan Jelm and um, Pete Batard or Neiman and other guys as well. Yep. So if there's one thing you take away, please remember that USB is, is much more than a serial port with power. If you want to do a workshop on um, creating a USB device, it's going to be tomorrow at 10 p.m. in the big workshop room, which may be B04 or maybe A03. I'm sorry, I don't know the exact room number. And I guess we've run out of time for questions, so come talk to me if you um, want to ask anything. Thanks.